Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the State of the Service Roadshow for South Australia today. Uh, my name's Tim Goods, I'm from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and I have the privilege of being the MC and facilitator today. So I would like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we are broadcasting today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of all the country on which um, we are meeting today and pay my respects also and welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Uh, today's session follows a similar format to others around the country. Um, we'll begin by uh, hearing a keynote address from the Acting Public Australian Public Service Deputy Commissioner, uh, Rena Brunsma. Uh, and then we'll see a, uh, a short video um, produced by the APSC and then we'll uh, have a panel discussion uh, where you will all be able to um, uh, lodge questions and uh, ask questions of any of our speakers here today. So Chris Hewitt and Diane Brown will join Rena on the panel uh, to answer your questions and I'll tell you a little bit more about Chris and Diane later as I introduce them later in the session. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we kick off. Uh, if you have any issues um, in, in terms of tech and access, uh, send us a message via the chat box in, in GovTeams uh, on the broadcast. You'll be able to see that there. And also, please use the chat box to uh, send your questions through uh, for the panel session and we'll uh, sort through those and try and answer as many as, uh, or ask and answer as many of them as we can. So without any further ado, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Rena, Acting Australian Public Service Deputy Commissioner to deliver the Commissioner's address. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, South Australia. It's so good to be with you virtually. Some of my favourite things about South Australia, Flinders Ranges, Limestone Coast, the Murray River, um, you have some of the most beautiful natural scenery imaginable. And we're so very lucky in Australia, and it's uh, in this spirit that I also wish to thank and acknowledge the traditional custodians and caretakers of your country uh, and their elders from my home here in Canberra, which is Ngunnawal country. We have so much to gain collectively from a continuation of the cultural and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so with this in mind, I would also like to extend a special welcome and thank you to those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So today, uh, as Tim said, we're here to talk about the state of the service. Uh, we're taking time to look back over the year we've just had, and we'll take a little bit of time to think about the future. Uh, what a year it has been. So the first thing I wanted to do is actually to acknowledge each and every one of you. So despite pandemics, natural disasters, uh, chaos overseas, uh, you've continued to deliver for the Australian people. Um, as public servants, I think it's true to say that we all come to work every day to serve and you've continued to do that despite the challenges that you faced, uh, working from home whilst homeschooling, uh, working from your home office in the basement um, while somebody next door sucks the internet because they've been doing lots of gaming, um, receiving groceries during teleconferences, all of those things uh, you've worked through. And for that, uh, I congratulate and thank you. My team in ha Canberra became very well acquainted with Molly, my new office manager, a 70 kilogram Great Dane, uh, who decided uh, and became quite, became quite fond of participating in my conference calls. And I'm sure you've all got stories about your children and pets um, participating unexpectedly in various meetings. Let's have a look first at the year we've had. So the APS works across 567 locations in Australia and overseas. 97 agencies and 14 portfolios. Uh, in the beautiful South Australia, the public service was 9,800 people strong. So you make up around 6% of the full APS. The State of Service report paints a picture of a group of people in South Australia who are very engaged. It's great to see that you believe in what you do. The work, you work beyond what's required of you and you have the Australian people at the forefront of your minds. And that's something to be really proud of. 
The world around us is moving really quickly. We're constantly needing to keep up with the pace of change and the expectations of the communities and the people we serve. And in order to do so, we need to be collaborative and work as one enterprise when dealing with some of those increasingly complex and interconnected issues. We can do this best when we bring a range of perspectives and experiences to the table. So to effectively serve a modern Australia, we need to reflect the diversity of the communities that we serve. I think this is still a work in progress for us in a future state that I know you all aspire to. It isn't just about bringing in new people from a range of backgrounds, although that is really important. It's about having an inclusive culture in each and every team across the organisation. An inclusive team is one that thrives on difference, actively seeks out alternative views and challenges itself to see the world through the eyes of others. This is so important for delivering great services and developing policies that really work for the people who they're intended to assist. Of course, there's some practical reasons why we come to work each day. Uh, we all wanna make a difference, but we also need to earn a wage and care for ourselves and our families. Going forward, the APS will need to make sure that we remain an employer of choice for good and talented people who have a heart for service. It's not just about the pay, uh, it's knowing that our jobs are secure and having access to some of those non-monetary benefits. These are the things uh, that you've said are important to you and reasons why you stay in the APS. Who would have thought three years ago that there would be a global pandemic and that the world would literally shut down. It has changed workplaces and it's changed work expectations. It's sharpened our focus on where we need to be and what we need to do to prepare for future unexpected events. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how the APS is preparing. A year ago, we launched the APS Workforce Strategy. I'd like to think of the strategy as setting out the playing field and the goalposts from now until 2025. Importantly, it actually looks at the 97 agencies across the APS as though we are one organisation. So it's looking at how collectively we make sure we can tackle future challenges. There are three areas of focus in the strategy. It's about attracting, building and retaining skills, expertise and talent. It's about embracing data, technology and new ways of working and it's about strengthening integrity and purposeful leadership. For those of us who aren't in an executive or HR role, you may be asking, well, actually, what does it mean for me? How does it relate to me and my job? My personal takeout from the strategy is about challenging ourselves to take on new learning and development opportunities. Take every opportunity personally to be informed, skilled, qualified, inclusive, and future ready. For managers, it's about investing time and effort into the development of your teams, taking time for regular meaningful conversations that build people's capacity and confidence to contribute. I think it's safe to assume that any future um, digital and ICT transformation are going to play significant roles. And it's important that each of us, no matter what stage of our career or what role we are in, can operate confidently in a digital world. Recently, the digital profession, a team of around 30 staff, joined the APSC from the Digital Transformation Agency. And it's, their role is to help us build that capacity and capability service-wide. Thanks to that team, I have to say, I'm learning new skills every day. My new favourite toy is digital whiteboarding. Um, I'm a visual person and I love the fact that I can workshop ideas with a staff member who might be sitting in Townsville um, as though he was in the same room as me. And I should also mention the importance of data in this new world of work. I recently worked uh, on a secondment in the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. And I can tell you that one of the things that really affected individuals who'd been um, experienced the trauma of the bushfires was the need to keep retelling their story every time they met with a service provider, whether it was a state government provider, a local council, a not-for-profit, or they were applying for a government, a Commonwealth government grant. Imagine a world where our data was safely and securely communicated to those who needed to know about it uh, with the sole purpose of helping us out. The Australian data strategy is designed to get us to that utopia. 
And of course, as public servants, we're entrusted with a lot of personal and sensitive information. And we need to know how to make the best use of this information to deliver the right programs and services to those who need them. It's really critical for all of us, therefore, to grow the skills we need to make the best use of data in whatever role we're in. And it could be you might work in an HR area, you might work in policy, you might work in regulation. All of us will come across data in our daily jobs. Um, and it's really incumbent upon us to become really comfortable with data so that we can use it to increase the services and, and the support that we provide. To help us all reach our personal potential, uh, we've launched the APS Academy. The Academy is a hub of learning for employees at all stages of their career. In Canberra, the team, runs the, Academy, the team that runs the Academy is located at the Museum of Australian Democracy at Old Parliament House. This is a fabulous heritage listed building. The carpet, the bathrooms, the clocks on the walls, which no longer work, uh, are all treated as reminders of an incredible history. If you are ever in Canberra, please come to visit. We would love to take you on a tour. So what's different about the Academy? This is where you learn APS craft, the things every public servant needs to know to do their job really well. You can see on your screen the craft areas. You can, develop, you can access learning and development opportunities irrespective of your location or stage of your career through the Academy. A couple of examples. Foundation training in integrity, delivering great policy, professional development in human-centred design, or how to engage effectively with stakeholders. And in the recent budget, I'm really pleased to say that the APSC received funding to roll out new data and digital literacy and fluency training across the entire APS. And so this is going to be available from 2023. We're also developing professional EL2 programs. So for example, we've all as managers learned that managing a virtual team uh, can be a little bit different than managing a team in an office and it requires new skills and new ways of thinking. So this new program will help our very important middle managers acquire those skills. We're looking to roll the program out later this year and you'll be able to find details of that on the Academy website. The Academy is all about embedding a culture of continuous learning. You can read about this in the APS Learning Development Strategy and Action Plan, which is also on the website. To make it real for you though, I'd encourage you to think about new ways that you would like to develop in your career and to check out what is on offer. Maybe set yourself a goal and discuss this with your manager as part of your performance and development plan and be proactive, don't be afraid to invest in yourself. And managers, encourage conversations with your staff on this topic. It might not be training, it might actually be joining one of the APS professions. If you haven't heard about them before, we have three professions that you can join. One for HR professionals, one for people in the digital field, and one for data experts. Through the professions, you can join a community of like-minded public servants for networking, events, and collaboration. So if you haven't signed up yet and you're interested in these three areas, I encourage you to do so. Just again, check out the APSC website. Of course, the public service needs to have the right mindset and structure to allow us all to operate as effectively as possible. I often hear staff talk about the levels of decision making and the time it takes to clear an idea or document. Having worked in the private sector, I have to say that when I came into the public service, I was really surprised. We operate in, a, in for many re good reasons in a hierarchical way. But something I wanted to let you know about today is the hierarchy and classification review. So the review looked at how we can work in more streamlined ways, with less hierarchy, with greater mobility, in a way that engages more effectively with risk and ultimately supports improved decision making. This was an independent review and it had two elements, culture and structure. So the pandemic really showed us that we can work differently. So our culture has shifted. We engaged more with risk because we had to. We now need to make sure that our culture continues to grow from this experience. We don't want to go backwards. And in terms of structure, structural change actually occurs pretty rarely in the public service. In our 120 year history, the classification system that we have today has only really come about as a result of two major reforms. There was a shake up in the late 80s 
and then a move to the current APS and executive level structures in 1998. It's timely, and you might actually say essential, uh, to ask whether our existing structure supports or inhibits our capacity for innovation, in agility and delivery. The final report and recommendations from the review will be presented to government after the election, so you will hear more about this so shortly. I'm personally excited about the idea that we're open to changing the way we've always done things so that each of us has a little more skin in the game. Now we'll move to looking at the future or preparing for the future. Like employers globally, you've heard it, uh, everyone experiences it, skill shortages, particularly in ICT, digital and data. To illustrate, Australia is actually estimated to need approximately 156,000 more digital technology workers by 2025. And that's against a backdrop of global skills shortages. Having flexible work arrangements will be one way we can attract the best talent. It's pleasing to see that about 75% of us agree that if we request a flexible work arrangement, it will be given reasonable consideration. The use of flexible working arrangements, including working from home in the APS, predates COVID. It'll be a mainstay for the APS to be seen as an employer of choice. Of course, working flexibly looks different depending on your role. If you need to access a protected workspace or you're a frontline officer that needs to be there for your customers, um, your arrangements may look slightly different to people who work in a policy role or sort of in a role that's behind the scenes. We need to get the balance right between flexible work and delivering on behalf of government and the Australian people. We need to make sure that teams are supporting one another and their customers while also enjoying the benefits of new ways of working. So if you're a manager, think about how you can embrace these new ways of working. As a team member, think about how you can make it easier for your manager to keep a strong team connection. You can be really proactive in this space working together to in introduce new flexibility into your roles. I would encourage you to think about work, what worked well during COVID and keep practicing and learning from these things. An interesting anomaly when we talk about APS skills shortages is that we actually advertise most of our roles as Canberra based. However, the majority of the talent we need lies outside of Canberra. And I can hear a whole lot of South Australians saying to me now, yes, we know. <laughs> So we need to be thinking differently about where we do our work. It's interesting to note that we advertise for data and digital roles, mostly in Canberra, whereas 90% of the talent for those roles is not actually in Canberra. Hybrid work, splitting work between both the office and home is not a new concept and will almost certainly be a feature of a contemporary APS. In the recent budget, the APSC received funding to establish four pilot APS hubs. So these will be multi-agency workspaces and agencies will be able to book workstations for staff, allowing them to work, uh, re recruit in new areas, um, even if the job might be attached to a Canberra-based team. So we're gonna start rolling those out in 2023. The locations haven't been decided yet. The Secretary's Board is um, having a look at some of the data and will make recommendations to a new or returning government uh, after the election. This will also be good for the regions because public sector wages will stay in the area and public, service, public servants can remain closer to the communities that they serve. Our entry level programs allow students and grads to put their academic qualifications into, into a real world setting while also learning the APS craft. Most of our entry level participants are asked to move to Canberra. So this allows their agency to provide the appropriate supervisory support. And whilst I love Canberra, I can see that not everyone would want to move here, um, particularly as you're very first starting your career. We're going to set up some APS Academy campuses alongside universities in regional areas and outside of Canberra. This was also part of the re recent budget announcement. So this will focus on allowing in particular data and digital cadets, apprentices, interns and graduates to join the public service without leaving their community. We'll have expert supervisors on site who work closely with the university to ensure that students have flexibility to balance their studies with their new APS career. 
And these new campuses will be up and running in 2023. You'll also hear more about that uh, going forward. Finally, I wanted to share with you how the experience through COVID has really shown us that flexibility is possible. New ways of working can empower staff to deliver positive outcomes. One of the successes has been the APS Surge Reserve. So through the Surge Reserve, public servants across the country have been redeployed at pace and scale, at a pace and scale never seen before. We've had more than 4,500 people who are, over the past two years who have taken themselves out of their current job uh, and started to undertake a completely different task where there was an area of need. An example most recently is 500 or more staff were deployed to Services Australia from 23 different agencies, helping to process disaster payments to Australians as a result of the floods in New South Wales and Queensland. If you haven't heard about the APS Surge Reserve, have a look. Um, it's not just for Canberra-based staff. We have had staff participate in all of the states and territories. And we also have arrangements where staff in the states and territories can assist the state and territory governments for things like COVID payments and emergencies. The surge is a great example how we are better when we operate together, removing traditional barriers and silos. My own staff engaged in the serve, surge and staff who were usually developing sort of policy uh, in the APSC worked on the phones, processed payments for small business and uh, people who were affected by the floods. And they all had a really positive experience. If you haven't experienced the Surge Reserve, have a chat to your manager. You can generally work in situ with training provided by the host agency. I think the Surge Reserve is an example of the APS working at its best. We're all working together for whatever is the most important need at the time. I'd like to finish up by talking about the caretaker period as we all await the outcomes of the upcoming election. It's a really good time to reflect on the very important relationship between the public service ministers and their officers and our role as impartial and objective advisors. For those of you who are outside of Canberra, you may not be aware, but we prepare what we call incoming government briefs. We call uh, the briefs that we prepare if the ALP is elected the Red Book and the book that we, uh, the, the briefs that we prepare if the uh, coalition is returned to government is the blue book. In these, we outline key policy issues and we provide advice and recommendations. Importantly, we show the incoming government that we've heard what they want to achieve and we're ready to hit the ground running. The smooth transition and a strong partnership between the APS ministers and their staff is at the core of our Westminster system. It operates at its best when it's characterised by mutual trust, respect and confidence. Even if you don't have direct contact with ministers, it's fascinating to understand how their offices operate and what happens when there is a change in government or minister. So if you would like to know more, we have a set of guides now on our website. If you look for working with ministers, you can find these new guides under publications on the website. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say there will always be complex challenges for us to manage as public servants. They will require us to work together at our best. We'll need to work as one APS, harnessing the perspectives and knowledge that each one of us brings. The Australian public service is world class because of the sense of service that you all embody and the values that guide your work. So on behalf of everyone here um, who is part of the panel today, we wanted to thank you for the work that you do and to wish you well in 2022. Thank you very much, Rena. Uh, very interesting uh, address, both reflecting on, on the year gone by, but also looking uh, to the future and how some of our experiences will shape uh, our future um, both as a, a workplace, but also as a workforce. So, um, and a reminder that Rena will join the panel uh, for discussion shortly. So if you have any questions for her, um, feel free to uh, put, start thinking about them and putting them in the chat. One of the themes that um, Rena just mentioned was one APS and how we are all fundamentally working towards the same goal. 
And uh, at, at the end of last year, uh, the APSC branched out into uh, uh, video production and um, created, uh, produced a video to showcase just how diverse the APS is as we move towards and work towards this goal. And so we'd like to share that video with you now. Hi, I'm Kanchi from Newcastle. Hi, I'm Mark from Hobart. I'm Yana from Canberra, which is not all country. I'm Simon from Brisbane. I'm Kay and I work in Geelong, Victoria. My name is Mirage and I'm based in sunny Nauru. I'm Zara, based in Fitzroy Crossing, over 3,800 kilometres away from Canberra. What one APS means to me is working towards something bigger than yourself. Engaging, collaborating and sharing knowledge. No barriers between agencies. We already have a good history of coming together to solve complex problems. Bringing all of that diversity that people bring with their backgrounds. Through teamwork and collaboration. This is One APS in action. We provide face-to-face -face service support to our most vulnerable, remote, disadvantaged and Indigenous customers. I've helped customers with bushfire claims, with flood claims, even cyclone claims. Helping Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse background. Bettering the lives of the Australian community. <laughs> like this little guy. I want to have one APS that can demonstrate people um, with disabilities in leadership um, positions. It's just been great to be part of one APS where we all work together. Towards a common goal as one APS. One APS. Well, there you go. So that's a really useful little video um, demonstrating the diversity of the APS. So we now move into our panel discussion and a reminder that if you have a question for the panel, please send it through the Q&A tab on GovTeams. And if you see a question that someone's already uh, asked and you also uh, want to hear the answer to that question, you can um, you can like that question and it will vote, vote that question up the list. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have Chris Hewitt and Diane Brown joining Rena for our panel session. Uh, Chris, welcome Chris Hewitt. Chris is the General Manager of Strategy and Industry Growth for the Australian Space Agency. And uh, Diane, Diane Brown, the, Sec the Deputy Secretary of Transport at the Department of Infrastructure, Transport and Community Development and Communications. Diane, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Chris, I might start with you, given uh, you come from an agency which is very new. We have a number of uh, very um, old, probably not the right word, uh, agencies, but long-standing agencies of government, traditional uh, agencies of government, uh, and, and your perhaps are working in, in one that sits at the edge, exploring some of those new, new ways of work and new areas of work. Can you tell us how you see the work your agency is doing will impact the future of the APS? Uh, yes, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and in fact, just to point out that the headquarters of the Australian Space Agency is in Adelaide. Uh, and uh, as Rena discussed, the current state of the public service where perhaps we can take more advantage of hybrid workspaces and uh, remote uh, or regional uh, workers joining uh, Canberra-based teams remotely. Uh, at the agency, we've been doing that really from the beginning, uh, which was in 2018. Uh, and my team consists of uh, team members based in Canberra, Adelaide, but also Launceston, Hobart, uh, Melbourne, um, Sydney, and Southeast Queensland. So we have a real mix of, uh, of work place locations. Um, all enabled, of course, by the uh, wonderful collaboration technologies that we all take for granted now. And I, so that's that's not an agenda, of course, that the space agency is is pushing um, as part of our remit. But absolutely, we are embracing the new technology so that we can um, harness uh, or we can 
harvest, I should say, the, the talent wherever it is in Australia. So I think that's one way where we are, where our style of work is perhaps a, um, an indicator of where the rest of the public service might follow in the future. Um, but one thing that our agency is doing that I think will, will really impact the APS or is perhaps once again a, uh, a harbinger of how the APS will work in the future um, is, is the whole of government approach that we're taking to establishing space capabilities and priorities across government. So our agency has been tasked with uh, building a, a national plan for space. It's known as the Space Strategic Update. Uh, and the idea is that we we unify all efforts towards uh, space capabilities, requirements, policies, etc., across government, but not only federal government, states and territories, and the broader space sector and economy as well. And I, I think that this is uh, we're seeing this increasingly from government and ministers. The request to bring whole of government coordinated um, policies and plans rather than the focus on uh, portfolio, uh, single portfolio stove pipe um, uh, plans and policies. So uh, we are building an investment plan uh, in space uh, and space capabilities that will capture the whole of government's requirements, which is quite a big job uh, and hasn't been done before in Australia. So very exciting. Indeed, and we'll all be looking to you to uh, solve our remote sensing challenges and so on as well, no doubt. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Uh, Diane, I'll turn to you. Um, but one of the things that Rena highlighted in the strategy is around data and tech, and I guess in your world of transport, whilst transport has been there as a, a, a theme of government forever, I guess, it, it is an example where data and tech really uh, must be having significant impacts. Can you tell us a bit about uh, how your work is evolving and, and what does that mean for future capabilities in the APS? Thanks, Tim, and hello. And good morning to everyone in South Australia. It's lovely to be able to part, be part of today's roadshow. Um, Tim's right. It's a really challenging and fascinating time to be involved in transport. I think during the pandemic, we all learn how important um, freight is. And in the South, recent South Australian floods, which I was involved with, we saw just how important those routes are to getting um, essential goods to Perth and Northern Territory and how they were affected by the recent floods. But we are seeing changes in, in um, transport and we need to, to continue to be able to address uh, those demands on freight and the increase in, uh, increasing demands on freight. So we're looking for ways to make freight and transport more productive. And one way of that is through taking advantage of new technology. Uh, two examples, uh, one, uh, using transport infrastructure to talk to trucks. So trucks can learn in real time when there's upcoming traffic conditions that might mean it'd be quicker for them to change their route. That will allow goods to move more quickly. Uh, the second example is uh, the work we're, that my team's doing right now and trying to support the introduction of autonomous or driverless trucks and, tr and planes without pilots so that we can see goods and people moved uh, without the need for, those tr for truck drivers or, or pilots. A lot of that will depend upon people being really comfortable with data. Well, there'll be a lot of data sharing that will need to occur between infrastructure, between business, between the people running the systems that will allow pilotless trucks and uh, aircraft to move. So in terms of what the APS needs going forward in the transport area, uh, I'll raise a few issues, but we need people that are comfortable with data. As Rena said, that's not unique to transport, but goes right across the APS. People that can understand the matters um, related to trans related to data, so privacy, security, and are comfortable dealing with data. I also look for people with imagination, people that can see the possibilities that, that increased access to data can create, and then people that are really good at collaborating. The APS doesn't have all the answers. A lot of our work is, is done best, as we learned during the pandemic, when we work with others. We need to continue to collaborate with business, collaborate with the states, 
and collaborate among government uh, to really make the full benefit of those data, uh, increased data and, and technology going forward. And the last point I raise in terms of capabilities for a future APS is really um, reinforcing one of the points Rena raised around the need for diversity. We need to continue to improve our diversity, find ways to support diversity, support everyone contributing in the public, in the in their job and to their job. Because we're only going to need, we're going to need lots of lots of perspectives to understand that the, the future and having a diverse workforce is one way of, an inclusive workforce, one way of ensuring that we do get the benefit of everyone's experience and knowledge. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, and um, Rena, you, you talked about, uh, I think you said 9,800-ish um, public servants in South Australia, but we've seen a, a fair um, shift in the demography around the country of people seeing the possibilities of working away from or major capital cities uh, uh, particularly. Uh, can you say a bit more about how you see the future workforce of the APS in terms of the geographic sense and if you've got any thoughts on any opportunities but also management challenges that that might um, create. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, no, it's no longer really optional, is it, to um, be recruiting people um, outside of the major capital cities. Um, we actually really do need to tap into the skills and talents that are out there. So I think it's inevitable that that is going to be a feature of the public service going forward. Um, I mentioned that the government invested $36 million uh, in the last budget, and that's a strong signal that this does have to occur. Um, so the, the money that came through the budget, the four APS hubs will each have around 25 to 30 workstations in them. Uh, and the uh, APS Academy campuses, four of those, will also have 30 to 35 uh, workstations within them. Um, but increasingly, it shouldn't matter whether there's a physical premises. I mean, it, a physical premises allows that collaboration and face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but, you know, as you know, the Space Agency is doing, the team members can work. We've proved that with technology, we can work effectively anywhere. And um, I think one of the things that we need to be reminded of when we're working in a dispersed team is the ability and the effort that it requires to remain connected. So I mentioned that it requires a different type of management style um, and it requires team members to also be quite proactive. Um, all of those things that we learnt in COVID about, you know, logging in regularly and having regular conversations and opportunities to connect um, are increasingly important to teams that work really well um, from div diverse um, locations. Um, but I, you know, I absolutely think that there will be more and more uh, people in remote and regional Australia working for the Australian Public Service into the future. Yeah, I've only I've only been um, a member of the APS for almost two years, and coming from a state government, uh, I, I thought we were pretty slow in our recruitment practices there. But it's um, it's been even more uh, challenging I found in the APS, and I wonder um, whether we, there's going to be some challenge to the core ways we do some of those really important businesses if we're if we're looking at a far more diverse and uh, dispersed workforce as well. Well, I think in, in terms of recruitment, we have to have a different recruitment mindset. You'll know that when you recruit now on APS jobs, it will ask you, where is this job located? It's really tempting to tick your home office, um, but actually really challenge yourself. Does this really need to be somebody who works in my area? Um, tick all the boxes and you'll see that you'll get a really diverse range of people um, up applying for the work. And um, that contributes to a diverse range of thinking, which leads to better outcomes. Chris, there's a, there's a question um, about the, the physical footprint of the APS uh, in the future and uh, given improvements in technologies and also the, uh, the, the shifting and evolving um, approach that Rena's just been talking about. Uh, how do you see, the, the question is will working from home become the norm, but it, it, there might be a, you know, how do you see, uh, broaden that out, how do you see the future of, of that flexible work? I think that we're already living it to a great extent where it won't be um, either working from home or in the office, it will be both and um, 
already many people work one or two days at home and the rest in the office or that or they are very flexible uh, as arranged with their, their team and their managers uh, if they need to be at home for something they uh, they uh, can still work from home um, I had a water tank delivered during a seminar I was presenting that, but I had to be at home so that that wasn't quite the same as the dog jumping up onto the keyboard of course but you know it, it actually um, it provides so much opportunity for us to manage our whole of life better rather than uh, just being purely at work or purely at home. Uh, and one of my team members, uh, she's based in Canberra, but, her, but she's from Adelaide, her family's in Adelaide. So she takes the opportunity to go home to Adelaide, spend time with her family, and then work in the Adelaide office. So she, uh, uh, this idea of being able to work from anywhere means actually she can work from other offices as well. So it's not just about being at home and being in your home office. You can you can go and visit your colleagues wherever they are and work with them. So it, the future of work in terms of the footprints will be um, a really uh, interesting and, and um, complex one. Uh, it does mean, of course, that uh, there are challenges for us as planners and managers in, in having the uh, the right footprint in case everybody turns up at one office at the same time. But that's where I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what these APS hubs look like and, and seeing whether we can use those as well. Yeah, and there's some really effective um, uh, booking systems as well for, for real estate uh, too. I, I did see, Rena, uh, recently uh, um, a piece of work that the Coup committee, I think, had compiled across the main agencies, and really there was every possible permutation being tried um, as it suited the particular business needs of uh, agencies and so on. Uh, just wondering if the APSC is, is keeping a bit of track of that. It would be a really interesting piece of research to try and find that sweet spot of how do we um, push flexibility uh, and also how do we maintain those strong connections and build those connections uh, in teams to have high performing teams. Have you got any plans in that area? Well, I mean, for those of you who don't know what the Ku Committee is, it's the Chief Operating Officer Committee and it's a subcommittee of the Secretary's Board. Another subcommittee of the Secretary's Board, which works in parallel with this Ku Committee, is the Future of Work subcommittee. So this is a fairly new subcommittee and the sole focus of this group of secretaries is to think about the future of work. So research and, and initiatives that are coming from the KU subcommittee are, are being shared with the future of work subcommittee. And within the APS, we have a cross agency task force um, that is then there to evolve these ideas and to really be pushing forward what will the, the APS look like into the future and how do we best enable and support that. Um, so in some instances teams can do a lot themselves but it's up to uh, the system to support these new ways of working and so we're looking at where are the barriers in the system that prevent those ways of working uh, and what can we do to encourage um, innovation, uh, agility and you know teams trialing out different ways of working mm. thanks uh, and an important one um, I'll, I'll give each of the panel the opportunity to comment but perhaps Diane to you first um, we're talking about uh, flexible working arrangements but uh, do we have any experience across our agencies here where um, uh, one APS has uh, perhaps enabled uh, First Nations staff who have moved off country for a position to to move back to country and, and continue their role on, on country that um, has some cultural uh, challenges but also some technical ones in some parts of the nation, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, that's a really good question. I think it's something we need to be thinking about if we haven't um, already put systems in place. Uh, at our department, we've got a commitment to try and increase the employment of Indigenous people. And I think we need to be looking at all the ways we can do that and make sure we do fully embrace the capabilities of Indigenous people and their interest and ability to contribute to, to the outcomes we're seeking. Uh, in regional development, which is part of our department, that is a very live question. Um, we have uh, got a substantial budget uh, increase in budget 
uh, last budget to do some really good work in regional development. And I think that's, I'm going to take that question away and raise it with the Deputy Secretary in regional development, see if we can't think about it and how we can make that part of our consideration for when we're increasing our staff uh, working in, in right, right across Australia. It's a very good question. Mm. Chris, anything you've got on that theme? Uh, so similarly, we have not considered that, but uh, absolutely uh, we should. Um, and as I say, there's there's no no obstacle to to uh, there's no geographic requirement to, to be located with us in, in either of our main um, centres. So um, we are absolutely. Uh, looking at ways to increase our Indigenous um, team membership uh, and we are part of the, you know, you know, we take full advantage actually of our department's Indigenous employment uh, uh, programs um, to great effect. So that, that is mm -hmm. something we'll look at too. And, and Rena, what are you seeing across the OPS? So um, across the APS, we have a Commonwealth Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce strategy. And I think it raises the issue that we do need to remove barriers to employment in the APS for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. When we were developing the policy for the APS Academy campuses, um, this was very important to us. And the conversations that we've had, uh, for example, we've been uh, meeting with Charles Sturt University in Darwin um, because they actually do have quite a high proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Um, so we're really keen to um, explore the idea of having uh, the APS Academy campuses so that those students can actually um, join the public service without leaving uh, the, the Northern Territory. Um, and, you know, in some instances we will look further into the future about whether it even means coming to Darwin. Um, so they can stay close to country, um, but they can also feel out, that they, they're more connected and they're closer to the communities that they serve. So that's definitely for um, two of the locations that we're thinking about with the APS Academy campuses, Darwin and Townsville, um, will be front and centre to how we look to support more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the work of the APS without leaving country. Mm. If, I, if I can stay with you, Rena, there's... Uh, um a really practical question around uh, the, the notion of one APS and, and the, the observation is that there can be quite broad um, material differences in remuneration between agencies uh, which makes uh, retention of staff challenging at times uh, for the agencies with the lower levels um, and a question whether there's any push to bring in um, one APS pay uh, uh, bans um, as part of the move towards one APS more generally. Look, I, I think this is a topic that is live with the Secretary's Future of Work subcommittee. Um, it's, uh, I think the Secretaries agree and acknowledge that there are disincentives to um, acting as one APS through uh, through our current arrangements. That's a really big shift, um, so it, we wouldn't uh, enter that lightly, but those conversations are happening. And I guess uh, for those of you who are watching election commitments quite closely, um, some of the ALP's election commitments have hinted towards um, standardised uh, pay across the service. Um, so look, those, that, that's a, it's a big systems shift because as I said before, the APS has grown up over 120 years uh, into what it is today. We have a thousand flowers blooming. Um, to bring that back in together is quite a big systems change, but there's definitely uh, thought uh, going on at the moment and considerations with that Future of Work subcommittee about what would that look like? How practically could you make that happen? Um, it's, it's got to be affordable to the taxpayer um, and it's got to work for everyone. So. Um, I, I would just say that those conversations are happening and some of that research is underway. Mm. And I guess the uh, potential for uh, one of those rare but major systemic changes, uh, if, if things come from the classification review, might be um, provide opportunity there. Mm. Um, I guess for the panel generally, but uh, another sort of one APS focused question around uh, procurement and designing of, of solutions. Um, 
and what opportunities uh, panel members have seen for improving information sharing with systems and eliminating the, the need for each agency to reinvent the wheel and some of the, the things that you're seeing there. Diane, can I ask you to start on that one? Yeah, happy to. Look, um, I'm a little bit new to the public service as well, not as new as you, but I had a background in the private sector and the public sector, but a private sector prior to joining the public sector in 2013. <coughs> One of the great things I see in the public sector is you can develop a really wide network across the public service and there's people that know something, know everything somewhere. I would encourage everyone to really think about developing networks and reaching out to those networks and sh using those to share and learn, share what we learn and what we know across all of our responsibilities, not just procurement, but everything that we do. I found it invaluable just staying in touch as I move around the public service meet more public servants just to stay in touch with them and keep that network alive as a way of um, having access to the best knowledge and not having to learn everything from scratch every time I look at something. Mm. And Chris? Um, so I, I mean, I think there's a lot of scope for uh, um, unifying our systems so that we can share particularly the data that, that Rena was talking about um, and making that available within uh, appropriate privacy and policy constraints, of course. Um, and there's a lot of scope for uh, a single provision of critical collaboration tools across the APS that would help us uh, collaborate with each other. Uh, at the moment, there's a bit of a uh, proliferation of different tools. Uh, Teams versus uh, Skype versus WebEx and, and others. Um, so I do look forward to there being a single one that we can all um, reliably see each other on. Um, but there's also, you know, we can't also lose sight that uh, the APS is very broad, 97 agencies, as Rena said, um, some of which have very specific requirements and of course uh, these are not shared across. So finding that perfect balance of the core technologies that um, enable collaboration and enable us to work together seamlessly with uh, value for money and uh, with the specialist tools that that particular agencies need. It's not an easy task, but I think we absolutely need to take that approach. Hmm. And Rena? Thanks. Um, I, I'd like to refer to the work of the Digital Transformation Agency. So over the past uh, few years, they've articulated sort of an, a whole of government architecture. And what happens now when an agency comes forward with a new proposal to invest in some sort of system, um, particularly those sort of corporate systems, um, that needs to be considered for how it could be reused across the whole Commonwealth. And a good example, just I guess referring to um, procurement, um, Services Australia is uh, developing a whole of government enterprise resource planning system called GovERP. Um, and so that system is, is designed to, uh, to join up the back office systems uh, that we use for corporate functions across multiple agencies, um, starting with you know, some of the, the larger agencies. Um, we have one uh, shared services hub, the service delivery office, uh, which will, will use that and um, allow its clients to use that. So um, for sort of procurement processing arrangements, there will be more consistency once that system comes in, um, that we're all actually using the same system uh, to, uh, to manage procurements, even though we all can keep our data sort of um, uh, contained for our agency. Um, we're all actually using the same business processes uh, and we have the same expectations about how procurement is managed. And I guess just to put a, a practical example for how some of that networking and, and across uh, APS work happens, we're a very small agency in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. We've actually got a very significant uh, IT um, and program management procurement and we're using a panel from the Australian Federal Police. Uh, and so there is mechanisms across the APS to leverage the, the sort of significant procurement work that other agencies have done. And so I'd really suggest to people to work with their own procurement teams to access some of those cross, uh, cross government teams. And I guess um, as the last question, um, on a similar theme, uh, Rena, uh, probably for you, uh, a question about given the amount of recruitment that goes on across the public service and 
people seeing um, very similar jobs advertised again and again. Uh, I guess a bit of a sceptical question about um, people wondering whether the merit pools that are put in place are really being uh, looked at and reviewed by agencies before advertising. So maybe if you could just give a bit of um, uh, colour to the what happens behind the scenes in some of those issues. Yeah, this is actually uh, an issue that one of my teams is looking at at the moment. So merit lists uh, and pools are developed quite regularly, but what seems to happen uh, is that they're not routinely shared and it doesn't come to your mind first and foremost to go and have a look at a merit pool. So uh, we are working uh, to establish merit pool sharing through the APS jobs platform. Um, this is something that the team is going through user, user design research at the moment to find out how we can best facilitate that, the sharing of merit pools and make it easy for users. I have a steering group meeting tomorrow uh, to actually test some of the, um, the prototypes uh, with, uh, with a group of APS stakeholders. So hopefully we'll get better at that. Um, the other thing that we're looking at for APS jobs is how we better support sort of micro assignments, um, mobility opportunities and secondments. So rather than it being a, uh, you know, a temporary or non-ongoing or ongoing uh, role, what about if it was just a more informal thing where I have capacity at the moment, a bit like Airtasker, and I could go and help out uh, another organisation because I really want to find out what the space agency is doing. Um, those sort of opportunities. So I think we can be more sophisticated about how we use uh, APS jobs uh, to allow that greater mobility across the service. And I'm really looking forward to the day where the space agency allows us to all be working from the moon. <laughs> uh, sooner than you think. Thanks. <laughs> Scarily so. All right, well, thank you very much. And that, that brings our panel discussion um, to a close. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, uh, Rena, Chris, and Diane, for sharing their experiences with us and their insights. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for watching and contributing um, some great questions to our edition in SA of the State of the Service Roadshow. Uh, and uh, there have been more questions asked than uh, we had the time to answer, but we'll be sharing the questions with the APSC executive uh, and, and panel members accordingly. Uh, and there'll also be a recording of this session, uh, which will be made available on the APSC website, which I'm sure we'll all be watching over and over again. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say many thanks to the uh, tech people who, um, whilst I'm sure it's all been seamless in the front of house, uh, perhaps not so uh, behind the scenes in the lead up. So thank you to everyone who's made this session possible today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much.